Whoa! What in the hell's going on? <laughs> yep. How in the hell is everybody? Hopefully you can hear me. Let's see. Yep, yep. The mic's on. Can you actually, can you hear me? I'm not really feeling that well tonight, so I'm probably gonna make it a shorter one. But. Sonny Grant sent me some links that were pretty good. I, I, went, I went on to that news site that I had, and it's weird. You know, I actually found the article where they mentioned that one of them was missing. Oh, I don't know. I was worried about the podcast because I haven't done one before, and I'm not sure. It's hard to get your voice in because you're it's just, I don't know, it's different. Okay, yeah, one of the things I was going to show you guys was the, in that photo uh, from yesterday, this one right here that was on the, uh, the thumbnail of the video. Now, if you go to street view here, it shows you that we were accurate. So right here, this this is where I have her located. Wow, things are moving around weird on the screen there. Come on, I didn't, okay, right there. All right. Come on, Google Earth, catch up. I can tell that you're not catching up. See that right there? I think that's the same 50 mile an hour sign that you see, even though it's years later, they rarely change those locations. So look, right there, 50 mile an hour sign. It's just so much snow that it's high up and then there's a dead tree back there. And it might be like this dead tree there. It's a different angle though, right? So you're, that photo's taken about like this, so. You know, from that angle. So you got the 50 mile an hour sign and then this dead tree back there. I don't know if you guys can even see that. It's pretty small. Let's see if I can, uh, well, anyways, you can hardly see it, but it's 50 mile an hour sign and there's a dead tree back there. I don't know if that's absolutely the same tree, but I'm sure that's it because it's literally right next to the spot where we had it. Look, right there. That's the, you can actually see the shadow 
of the sign that was right on the ground right there. There's the sign, so you know, right in this area right there. So maybe a little bit further this way, you know, like uh, just like Okay, now if, if you saw the show last night, you saw that there was a cold case from 1982 that the uh, the same coroner who's working on, or the same medical examiner who's working on the uh, case of the unidentified person on Peak Six who was shot, but uh, they apparently looks like he killed himself, but they just can't identify him, and they're going to do Paravon Nano Labs and phenotyping. I brought it up to them and they said, oh yes, and they got the funding to do it. Now this case, it sounds like they might not have the funding for it, so maybe we could try to do some sort of a crowdsourcing because in this case, in 1982, Bobby Joe Oberholzer and uh, Annette Schnee were both killed on the same day, January 6th. Um, Bobby Joe Oberholzer was found on January 7th, so the next day. However, Annette wasn't found for months. She was found, I think, in uh, June or July, something like that. And one of the items found was a glove and a tissue, and both have male DNA on it. One of the things that was interesting was that they uh, they have an image also of an individual that they can't identify, but it was on one of the two girls. So let me let me get that open. not reading any comments so I apologize if you can't hear anything or something's going wrong yeah so this one right here was in Annette Schnee's on her person look at this weird one I mean this guy looks like uh, something right out of a horror movie Right? Like he's missing an eye over there. But this picture was with her, and nobody can identify her. It's almost like the person left it there. I, I don't know. I actually have no idea who this person could be. Right? I mean, it could be the killer, but why would the killer leave a picture of himself? Doesn't that seem stupid? Yeah, and so on... Annette's body, they found this orange sock and then on one foot, and then on her right foot was this sock and that shoe, so it didn't match. However, they found the other orange socks with uh, Bobby Joe Oberholzer's body associated with it. It's crazy. All right, so let's get into some of these articles that were sent to me earlier. A little, little bit longer, all right? When 29-year-old Bobby Oberholzer hopped into her, the car of her killer, it was the second time she had hitchhiked that day. Oberholzer worked in Breckenridge, a popular ski resort town in Colorado. The temperature in January routinely sits below zero degrees Celsius, so those who live in nearby towns would regularly hitch rides from the frequent vehicles heading to the ski slopes. That evening was a freezing 29 degrees Celsius. Great for skiers, but terrible for those planning to get around town without a vehicle. The horrific events of January 6, 1982 put an end 
to this practice of hitchhiking rides with a bandit. Oberholter phoned her husband, Jeff, shortly after six that evening to inform, uh, to inform him she was going to uh, after work drinks and that she'd hitch a ride home. She had just got promoted. She planned to be home within a few hours. When she still hadn't made it home late in the evening, Jeff rang her friends who told, why would, that's so weird that back then, you know, the husband would just say, sure, yeah, hitch a ride home. I mean, I would, <laughs> there's no way in hell I would let somebody do that. Jesus. When she still hadn't made it home late in the evening, Jeff rang her friends who told him she just uh, left before eight. She was sighted around his, around this time at a mini mart 30 odd meters from the pub where she presumably flagged down a ride. The next morning, a rancher found Oberholzer, uh, where she worked, however, let's see if we can. This is the uh, pub she was at right here. So just 30 meters. Oh, wow, you can actually go inside of it. <laughs> that's, that's weird. I didn't mean to do that. But. Apparently just 30 meters from the entrance of that, there's a mini mart. And I'm not sure. I think it could be one. I don't think it's there anymore. But I think it was out on this street right here. And I think she was, you know, because this is the main street where you would hitchhike, not on some weird side street. So she went into the bar there and 30 meters away. I mean, it's possible it was right, right there or something at the time. You know, maybe one of these buildings was a mini mart. We don't know. But she got a... A ride and she was going to be heading south which is this direction so she was going to get a ride and head down this way and that's actually where she was found south down here 10 miles away there's a parking area here it there's some evidence that she got out of her car ran just like this green line shows and then ran down sort of the embankment or you know over the snow and then headed back and then was shot and then she fell backwards next morning a rancher found oberholzer's driver's license uh, on his property. Panicked and confused, Jeff drove there and while on the highway noticed Bobby's backpack sitting in an otherwise empty field in plain sight from the road. As he approached, he discovered a clump of tissues and one, uh, one of her gloves, both spat splattered with blood. DNA testing later found that the blood on both items belonged to a male. The contents of Bobby's wallet were later found scattered alongside the same highway. Hmm. Yeah, and it turns out that that highway, highway was way away from that area. Look, like, so she was killed right over here, but her backpack, gloves, Kleenex, and all that stuff was found right over here off of this highway. So it's almost like the killer must, must have lived up in this area somewhere. Because why would he drive up? I mean, he, it looks like kill, and then uh, Bobby Joe lived right here. I'm kind of wondering why the husband, though, was driving up in this direction. You know, why do you do that? The same evening that Bobby went for drinks with their work friends, 21-year-old Annette Schnee visited a nearby pharmacy in Breckenridge 
Breckenridge, excuse me, to fill a prescription. And that's uh, Schnee's orange booty found. See? She was with another young woman who witness later said looked as though she had been camping out for a few days. Given the sub-zero temperatures at the time of year, this uh, struck investigators as odd. Annette was overheard reminding the woman to buy cigarettes. This was the last time she was seen alive. Despite uh, an identity, let's see, an identikit picture being widely disseminated, nobody has ever identified who this mystery woman was. Annette was due at work at 8 p.m. at the Flipside Bar in Breckenridge. Her plan, according to those who attempted to trace her final movements, was to hitchhike back home to neighboring Frisco, uh, pick, uh, Frisco, pick up her uniform, then hitch back into town. Her uniform remained at her house. Annette never showed up at work, and she was never seen alive again. That was due at work at 8 at the Flipside Bar. So we have that one, too. See, both these girls worked in the same area. You just wonder if he killed and drove back and then took, picked up another hitchhiker, knowing how simple it was. Because look how, look how close this all lines up here. See, the, the red here is related to Annette. Okay, so the Mini Mart possibly was right here, but look how close Flipside Bar and the Village Pub are. You probably would have hitched a ride in almost the same area. You know, you would have walked from here, came out there, she would have walked to here. So right in this small area here is where you'd probably hitchhike a ride. These women were clearly abducted by the same woman. Yep, or same uh, person, excuse me. <clears throat> now, so Annette was wearing this shoe and this sock and this shoe and that sock. But what's weird is the other sock was associated with Bobby as well, or Barbara, as she's also known as. The next afternoon, mere hours after Jeff found his wife's item covered in blood, Bobby Olsolzer's uh, body was discovered 16 kilometers south of Breckenridge, Breckenridge, I keep saying which, by a cross-country skier. She was face up and six meters down a snow embankment of the side of the highway. She had a gunshot wound to her chest the severity of which suggested she was shot and killed at close range. She also had a plastic tie wrap around one wrist. It seemed likely she escaped as her captor was attempting to tie her wrist together. Her positioning down the side of the embankment and track marks in the snow suggests a struggle took place at the summit as she was attempting to flee. Her key ring was found 90 meters from her body in a parking lot at the summit of Hoosier Pass, attached to a sharp, large hook. Considering the blood found on the glove and tissue uh, was that of a male, it seems likely she used this to fend off her attacker. And this, this thing right here was given to her by her husband as a weapon to use off of her keychain. Oh yeah, right here. Her husband later told police he made the hook for her as a weapon should she ever get into trouble while hiking. Also sitting alongside her body was an item that didn't belong to Bobby, an orange sock. See, so that same, uh, the orange sock that matched the other sock was found next to her. This guy seems like a serial killer type, doing weird stuff like that. Almost six months later, in a remote mountain valley area, 32 kilometers south of Breckenridge, a nine-year-old boy was fishing and stumbled upon Annette Schnee's, Schnee's frozen, lifeless body. The body was close to five kilometers from the nearest highway, which is why it was discovered, wasn't discovered for 
over half of a year. And her body, so here's where Bobby was found, right there. And then Annette's body was found way down here. Right in this general area right here, near this, maybe this creek right there. See, it's kind of, you know, it's the same direction. So look right here, you see other items from Bobby dumped up this way. So that means this person would have gone this far down and then up. So maybe at this point pulled off, dumped her body, and then took the rest of Bobby's stuff and threw it out over here. Investigators had seen this sock before. It was an exact match for the one found with the body of Bobby Oberholzer. The link was clear. If they weren't certain the same killer was responsible for both women's death before, then they were now. The media quickly dubbed the crimes the Orange Sock Murders. Annette backpack, Annette's backpack was recovered along the side of the stretch of road between Breckenridge and where Oberholzer's body was found. Annette's backpack was found recovered along the side of the stretch of road between Breckenridge and where Oberholzer's body was. See, that's interesting. See? That means her backpack was found in between here on the side of the road. The orange sack, sock had somehow been overlooked. They later must have fallen from the car and down the embankment where it was found with Bobby's body. Annette's backpack contained a number of interesting leads. Among the items in her backpack was a photograph of a man in his late 20s to early 30s squinting at the camera. It, it is framed closely against a white wall and is positioned is dead on center. It looks like either a mugshot or an acting headshot. None of Annette family or friends have seen this man before. Despite a 36 year search, nobody has ever been able to identify who he is. Isn't that crazy? I mean, how come they don't just put a put it on the in the news? National news, you know. Dockingly, Annette's wallet contained the business card of Jeff Oberholzer, Bobby's husband. Huh, that's weird. This was a striking coincidence. Huh, that is, see, that's what is strange, right? So, the husband of Bobby Oberholzer had a business card that was found with in Annette's wallet. But what if the killer did all that too, though? You see what I'm saying? Like, what if he... Because you know how he's mis mismatching and moving things around and confusing things? What if he did that? What if he just took the business card out of his wife's wallet and put it in Annette's uh, possession? And this is supposedly what the person looked like that... Annette was uh, told to buy some cigarettes. Jeff Oberholzer's reasoning was simple. He claimed he had picked up Annette hitchhiking a few months before she and his wife were murdered and had given her his business card. Why would he do that? Though? One point in Jeff's favor was that he had volunteered this information to police six months earlier after they questioned him following his wife's disappearance. He initially claimed he didn't know Annette at all, but a few days later, upon seeing her photograph, told police he actually recognizes her as a woman he gave a lift to. Yeah, I know. Can I just read the? Can I just read it out, Miss Angels? I don't need you to fill it in. I just, I just read that part. Okay, it's in the article. That's what I. That's why I'm reading it. You see that? Thanks. 
He had given her card a card of his appliance repair business after she mentioned needing to get something fixed. So police were aware of his link prior to finding the car. Still, it seems suspicious. Jeff passed a poly... I mean, the whole thing comes down to they probably didn't test his... <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, listen. I don't think he has anything to do with it. Okay? Because they obviously would have tested the DNA in the future that was on the glove and the Kleenex, and it's not going to... It, it wouldn't match, right? Jeff passed a polygraph test, but his alibi for that night could not be confirmed. Yeah, it's hard to confirm an alibi when you're by yourself. He claimed to have been hanging at his house with a friend while he waited for Bobby to come home. Well, I guess he wasn't by himself. But his friend had left the area and couldn't be tracked down until December 1990. Really? Close to nine years after the murder? Really? The man then confirmed he had spent some time at Old Berholzer's house that evening, but the times he provided didn't match those given by Jeff. In the nine years that had passed, DNA testing had been introduced, uh, which was a boon for cold case investigators. Suddenly, years old blood samples, such as the ones found on the tissues and on Bobby's glove, could be reliably tested to zero in on or rule out suspects. In fact, it was the technology that showed the blood belonged to a male previously it was presumed to have been Bobby's given the violent nature of her death. See, they didn't even know that was from a male until DNA was invented, or, you know, discovered, basically. All right, so after that was discovered, they were able to say that it was a, a male, and they had always thought it was just Bobby's blood. DNA testing showed that Jeff was not a match, and he was ruled out as a suspect. Do you see what I'm saying? There's the answer. No, I don't think it's much of a coincidence at all. It's kind of maybe a coincidence, but he's not the killer because the blood that was on the glove and the tissue isn't his. Unless you're saying he went over and drew blood from somebody then squirted it on those items to throw off the uh, investigation. Thomas Edward Luther picked up a young female hitchhiker the month after the Oberholzer and Schnee murders and sexually attacked her. He was charged with the crime and while doing time, boasted to an inmate that he was the one who killed Annette and Bobby. Police gave him multiple lie detector tests, which he failed, and DNA testing completely ruled him out. However, Luther was subsequently linked to and charged with another murder and is currently serving a 48-year sentence. Wow, that's... This case is nuts, man. Many years passed, and although a handful of suspects were questioned, DNA tested, and dismissed throughout the 1990s, there was no solid leads for the murders. Police were desperate for anything, and in 2006, over 24 years since the murders, help came from an unlikely source. The Discovery Channel's Sensing Murder decided to profile the case, or Sensing Murder which uh, brought home national attention and a slew of off-kilter information. The premise of the series involves tasking two psychics, oh boy, with solving the case. The pair were interviewed separately and given no initial information into the murders. Right, right, that's what they tell you anyways. Both seemingly provided the same first name for a suspect, similar description of the vehicle that picked both women up and suggested that Schnee was murdered at a different location from where her body was found. A task force spent four hours investigating news sites, only to come up empty-handed. Still, the show airing shone a new light on the case and led to renewed public interest. The following year, the crime hit the press yet again after a private investigator appealed to the public for new information. And by the way, this is AMP News. And this article, this article right here is from, let's see. Not too long ago, just uh, December 2018. That's interesting. Definitely wasn't picked up nationally. Uh, 
The following year, the crime hit the press yet again after a private investigator appealed to the public for new information. I believe it is reasonable to conclude that the man or men responsible for the truly brutal and senseless killing of Bobby Joe and, and Annette on that horrific cold night didn't just go into the seminary the next day and reform, P.I. Charlie McCormick said. McCormick had been working on the case for over 20 years at that point and had collected and examined uh, reams of evidence over the years. He like, uh, he, like those before him, had hit a dead end. Most likely the murderer went on to other violent criminal acts, which most likely would have been in the cause of them eventually entering the criminal justice system. 2015, a task force was put together by the Colorado Bureau, Bureau of Investigation, compromise of detectives, medicos, crime scene investigators, and legal experts with the aim of finally solving these crimes. A website, RockyMountainColdCase.com, was set up and compiled all the known evidence, crime scene photos, and detailed descriptions of the guns used to murder the two women. It's a comprehensive yet simple to navigate. Yeah, and that's the site we went to. Yeah, it's this one right here, look. See, this one. Technology is, uh, it says that the same DNA evidence that cleared Bobby's husband could also provide a match. Uh, the blood DNA evidence could be pretty difficult to refute if we could identify who it came from. See, they just need to do the, the DNA matching, the research. This is kind of a longer uh, sort of almost blog format on this one. I mean, it's pages and pages and pages. What I should do is put these in the uh, description. I'll do that right now. in the description now for you to take a look at. You can also see them in Gray Hughes Investigates on Facebook. Yeah, the male's never been identified. He seems like he'd be really easy to identify to me. So this is on uh, blogs.denverpost.com. When he was stopped in Nevada, he had the identification of three men who are missing and believed dead, McCormick said. When he was stopped in Nevada, he had the identifications of three men who are still missing and believed dead. Although, why do they have a picture of this? Though? Maybe this is a different case, no? Although, uh, with the remains suspect. One promising clue was discovered inside Schnee's blue backpack found north of Oberholzer's body. It was a picture of a man who has never been, a, been identified. The Park County Sheriff's Office has a copier jack, jacket bullet found in Oberholzer's body for ballistic comparison. 
So a copper jacket bullet. Another one about the sock was a mystery until six months later. Was there more before this one now? Mary. Yeah. Oberholzer was married to Jeff Oberholzer and he was a suspect for a while that he was cleared later. Yeah, it's weird if you just look at the timing of it all. So you, you've got somebody, you know, Bobby leaves her party at 7.50 to hitchhike home, and then she's found the next morning. But the other girl, Annette, was supposed to be at Flipside Bar, I think, at 8, right? So, and but she never made it to work. So it's, it's a really similar time. You know, it's almost like, but the thing is, is here, here's how I think this went down. I think that Annette was killed first. Okay. I think she was killed first. Um, I guess what, here's what it comes down to. Who, whose orange sock was it? I mean, I haven't heard any, I haven't heard Bobby's husband say, yes, that was her orange sock. Okay. I think it comes down to whose orange sock it was that got killed first. But I think Annette was killed first and then driven down here and dumped because Annette's got a missing time from like 445 and that never showed up at work, okay? And she never made it home to pick up her clothes to go to work. So if that's the case, he could have easily dumped her body down here and then went up again for another, uh, you know, another attempt. So let's say, let's say he gave her a ride at like 4:45 or so in this area. Kills her, and then he drives, let's say, a half hour to where her body was found. Then he drives back. So that's an hour total. And let's say, you know, he had her for an hour or so. You know, so then he goes back up in town. And you know you're getting close to within an hour of the time where Bobby Joe's getting off. Then he picks up her as a hitchhiker. And you know maybe he pulls over at this parking area since it is the winter, right here. And she gets uh, he she gets wind of what he's doing now. She gets nervous and she starts running from this parking area this direction and what's interesting though is that Annette must have been killed somewhere else because her purse or something was found on the side of the road in this area halfway between they said or between not halfway so you know her stuff was thrown and then maybe she her body was driven down there or maybe he just took her purse and threw it out the window and killed her down in this area and then just dumped her body in the creek, then drove all the way back up to the town, Breckenridge, picked up Bobby as a hitchhiker, and then apparently they stopped over here at this parking area. She gets out, runs this way, and he's following her. She kind of goes down the bank and then decides, well, that's not smart, it's snow, snowy bank, and then starts heading back up, and then he shoots her from close range, right in the stomach, and then she falls over backwards or maybe it was chest i can't remember now, but she was shot and then she falls straight out backwards onto her back i think it was her chest evidence indicated let's see okay this is the mini mart witnesses then saw her alone near the minute mart about 100 yards, the other article said 30 yards, from the pub entrance, hitchhiking southbound out of town, right? That's how I have it. Evidence indicated that she had fought her way out of the car parked at Hoosier Pass. So the guy probably parked, tried to do something with her, knew nobody was going to be driving around in the snow, cold, 
and then she fought him with that little hook thing that she had and then she tried to get out. it appears she popped him in the nose said charlie mccormick a member of the 11th judicial district homicide task force indicating the murders her husband jeff found overholzer's right wool glove stained with blood on us 285 it was one of the reasons he was initially a suspect mccormick said overholzer apparently ran 100 yards downhill before she was shot with a glazing bullet that struck her right breast okay so it's probably when she was running this direction down this hill this is a hill right here see that it's downhill when you look at it like that so as she was running the hundred yards down here he fired at her from behind and it grazed her right breast and then she ran down here came back up and he caught up to her and then shot her A second Winchester hollow point copper bullet struck her in the chest. Her tracks show hesitation and backtracking near the spot where she was shot in the back from a distance of only a foot or two. Orville Oberholzer staggered and tried to climb out of the snowbank after she was shot, McCormick said. Uh, she collapsed on her back and froze or bled to death, he said. It's difficult to tell. Plastic ties were found on her wrist, indicating someone had tied, uh, had tried to bind her. That's right. Um, so in the car, she was probably, the guy was binding her and was going to attempt to do something to her, but she was able to sort of free an arm and then struck him and tried to get away, and then he killed her. On July 3rd, 1982, Schnee's body was found in a remote area 10 miles south of Hoosier Pass, which is four miles north of her home. She was found face down in Sacramento Creek south in, of South Alma. South of uh, El Alma. The last time Schnee, Schnee was seen alive was 4.45 p.m. At, farm, at a pharmacy called the drugstore. See, and that's 4.45. So if he'd picked her up, let's say at five, he would have had time to kill her, dump the body, and then drive all the way back up. And then he went back home. See, I, I, here's what I think. See, I think this guy lives up in this direction somewhere. He was just hunting here that day. So he made one kill, drove back up, made another kill, and in this case, he still had her purse and so forth in her car because she fought. It was still in his car. And then he wanted to get the hell out of there after the shooting. So he drove this way. And then heading up here, he started tossing different items out the window. Okay, does that make sense? He was seen talking to an unidentified woman and was heard reminding the woman to buy cigarettes. Probably probably somebody she worked with, you know? Like, hey, get cigarettes for our breaks later at work, you know? The unknown woman was described by a witness as a white female, although she was looked like she was camping, so it doesn't make sense. Uh, yeah, so it looked like she'd been camping out for a few days. A woman smoked Marlboro cigarettes. Schnee picked up a prescription at the store. Schnee was scheduled to work at the flip side in Breckenridge at 8 p.m., the reliable worker did not pick up her uniform at her home about six miles south of Breckenridge, off Colorado 9, McCormick said. In the months after Schnee disappeared, officials believe cold temperatures and cold water helped preserve her body. A boy was fishing in Sacramento Creek, four and a half miles west of Fair Play, when he found the body of a woman in knee-deep water lying partially on the bank against the willow tree yeah. hmm. against the willow tree in early July 1982. The body was fully clothed, but the clothes were in disarray. It seemed 
to indicate that someone raped her and then dressed her. It appeared the body had been frozen and had thawed. Schnee was wearing the one orange sock, but she had a long striped sock on the other foot and was wearing shoes on her on both feet. Her other striped sock was found inside a bloody hooded sweatshirt. <laughs> Jesus, this, this is... This is a crazy story. I'm, I'm shocked that I've never heard of this one. I guess it was on, like, Unsolved Mysteries or something, like in 1992 or some shit like that. Why do I need to check out Kelly's tweet? I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. I don't. I don't agree with you, Kelly. Yeah, I don't agree with any anything that you said up there. Sorry about that. Uh, she had been shot in the back. The gunshot went through her body. The bullet was not found, but authorities believed. See, it's weird that one was shot in the chest and the other one in the back, with the same type of gun. Yeah. What What do you mean tweet? Who? What do you mean Kelly's tweet? What, what tweet are you talking about? There's no tweets in comments. It's just comments. There's no tweet. Yeah, just listen, everybody. Don't try to be, you know, ooh, I got his name, I got his name, these little internet sleuthy, you know. Uh, just, just listen to what we're talking about, okay? We're just going over the case. Don't try to pretend you just solved it all. We're just going over what likely the sort of the pattern of what happened was, okay? Oh, I got his name, I got his name. Oh, jeez, give me a break. My God, it's just ridiculous. Already? Jesus. And then you said tweet. There's no tweets on in a comment. The FBI Behavioral Science Unit wrote a psychological profile of the suspect at the time. The killer isn't sure he committed the crime because it appears as a dream to him. Ah, come on, FBI. <laughs> I think you've improved since then. Why don't you get a new person? It is believed the suspect does not feel good about what he has done. Although the suspect carries this heavy emotional burden, no, I think he does feel good about it. That's why he did it twice in one day. I think you need to go back to your profiling school. Colorado Bureau of Investigation was, you know, they think, they, the reason they're saying that is because the, the body was redressed again. So he had remorse and, and dressed the body. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. Yeah, can you quit uh, making comments regarding whatever whoever that idiot is above that was talk uh, tweeting or whatever the hell you were saying? Jeff Oberholzer was eliminated as a suspect for several reasons, including that he had an he had several alibi witnesses who had contact with him that night. The coroner said. Late 1983, Summit County Sheriff Investigator Tom Flores received a tip that Henry Lee Lucas, who had confessed to hundreds of murders across the country, had admitted killing a woman in Colorado in 1982 and several other Colorado women while crisscrossing the nation with the former lover Otis Elwood Toole. Lucas was convicted of murder in Texas but later recanted the other murder. This is the interesting graph right here because it shows where the different, like, I was showing you that V shape and, you know, Bobby's driver's license was found there, her backpack, glove, Kleenex here, 
And then uh, Annette's body was found right there. That looks pretty close to how I have it. Let's see. Wow, oh, it's so close. Look, look at that. Look at this. So you got this little, looks like this little road right there. And there's a slight dip, and then it comes up like that. So let's see what they've got in that map that was right there. So it goes like this. Let me, let me just look at that one more time. That's definitely the right, almost the exact location right there. So let me see that again. And this looks like they have it where, so this would be the up portion and then down and then it starts going up. I think they have that pin on this map, if it's accurate, right at the base of where it starts going up. So, so it's pretty close, but it, they have it about right there. So that was pretty close just based on them saying 20 miles and then five from the road. Is that? What are you talking about? <laughs> you guys are crazy. Anyhow, uh, let me get back to the. Uh, let me save this. The investigators had long believed that it was her blood because it was her blood type, but the DNA was that of a man. Whoever's blood it is has a lot of explaining to do, McCormick said. We're 99% sure it's the blood of the killer. Yeah, it's pretty obvious, right? They were convinced that it would link this that guy I mentioned earlier, Luther, to the crime and be key evidence leading to his conviction, but his DNA did not match, so it was not him. One theory is that Luther was with someone that, that night and the blood is that of the accomplice. Okay, well, of course. Well, that, I guess that was why it was sounded like it was out of order. This is the seventh one. The first, you know, should have been read last. That was it was confusing me when I was reading. Petroselli was arrested and later convicted of killing James Wilson, a Nevada Nevada car salesman, while he was test driving a Volkswagen pickup, according to Nevada appeals court records. And then over here to get back to the correct sequence. When he was stopped in Nevada, he had identifications of three men who are all missing and believed dead, McCormick said. Although uh, Petroselli and Luther remain suspects, most, most members of the 11th Judicial District Homicide Task Force believe that someone else killed the women, likely someone who was familiar with the rural road where Schnee's body was found, was discovered. I don't know. I don't agree with that either. I just think you could drive down, see a road going off the side and park it. I think the, the, the them leading up, well, it might be familiar with it, but I don't think that's where they live. It's probably someone local rather than someone just passing through. See, I think that's probably likely. But somebody that lives up northeast of there. One promising clue was discovered inside Schnee's blue backpack found north of Overholzer's body. It was a picture of a man 
who has never been identified. The Park County Sheriff's Office has a copper jacket bullet found in Overholzer's body for ballistic comparison. Anyone with information about this case is asked to contact Eagle County Crime Stoppers at 970-328-7007. All right. Well, I got to get I got to go to sleep. I'm not I think I'm I hope I'm not getting sick or something. It sucks. But I uh, appreciate you guys all showing up here tonight. And uh, I'm going to head off the bed. And I just wanted to get that all out there. And then next week sometime I'll try to get a hold. I don't think I'm going to be doing a show the next for like three days. So feel free to go watch the other guys. <laughs> all right. I got I to gotta do some other things. All right. Thanks, everyone. And until next time, be safe out there.